I remember the uh, the uh, just a small example, which is that the 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 Arihant, which is India's uh, nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarine. Uh, used to be called for the longest time before it got its name uh, Arihant and the name Arihant was broken by India Today magazine by Sandeep Unithan yes. when he was here my close friend and one of India's top defense journalists uh, but before that for the longest time it just had a working title of ATV which was Advanced Technology Vessel you know which is your typical anodyne vanilla name uh, and you know I used, to, I used to love thinking you know they're calling it ATV which is like the most, most plain Jane yeah. name for something that is probably the most awesome thing that the Indian establishment has ever built. Those famous uh, little briefcases you see carried by the, uh, the, by the uh, Special Protection Group, the SPG officers, uh, are actually uh, fold-out ballistic shields. Those are uh, basically for the close protection of the Prime Minister and uh, you know a, a, a guy like Narendra Modi who loves going out into the crowd, stepping out of his yeah. car, uh, you know, and being with the people. Uh, so the, that's why those have become much more visible now, because uh, basically if in the, in, 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 the, in the event that there is some kind of an attack uh, or if bullets fly, God mm. forbid, or any, something like that, uh, these shields basically fold out to the full length of the human body. Like everything in this world, uh, you know, there is a mundane layer to everything. You know, one would love to imagine that a guy in a suit is running with a briefcase through a dark, co you know, a corridor with intermittent lights, uh, you know, and is banging on a door and he needs to get one person's approval, then another person's approval, and then, you know, three people have to say the same code word in unison and only then a missile can be launched. Uh, you know, I, I would love it for it to be something like that, but unfortunately, these things are all, uh, you know, uh, are ultimately about executive decisions. Yeah. Since you brought up the Brahmos thing, uh, yeah, we uh, India definitely had egg on its face. It was a, a strategic embarrassment, uh, you know, because it was apparently a missile being maintained and it ac yeah. uh, accidentally got activated and it landed somewhere in Pakistan. Hello and welcome to the 12th episode of Inner Defense. Uh, I'm your host, uh, Dev Goswami, joined by uh, defense expert and journalist Shivaroor. Uh, on this podcast, we discuss everything to do with the world of defense. Uh, it's been 12 uh, episodes of uh, India Day, uh, sorry, Inner Defense is season two. Uh, and I was just wondering, I was talking to my producer, Anna, that, you know, maybe a few listeners who listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or on our website don't know that we are also available on video. So in case you'd like to, you know, just like over the weekend, watch us uh, in peace, uh, yeah. watch the two of us. You can go to YouTube, you can go to the uh, uh, India Today handle, which is India Today, and you'll see a podcast tab there. Just tap on the podcast tab and you'll find Inner Defense's playlist. You can watch this episode or, you know, all the previous episodes uh, that we've recorded. Uh, speaking of previous episodes, Shiv, uh, the last one got some quite some reactions and I'm guessing you got a lot of them from within the military. I can tell you it's uh, uh, it. Uh, I, I got a lot of bouquets and brickbats from the pilot community yeah. uh, from naval pilots as well as Air Force pilots. Uh, I can I can assure you that it became a big mess hall conversation <laughs> topic uh, you know across units and uh, I, I'm still getting messages about that mm. uh, but the one thing I can tell you is that uh, everyone said that it was a nice uh, substantive episode. Yeah. You know even that became Came a kind of big talking point. Yeah. Uh, everyone appreciated that we talked about something that usually isn't discussed in such detail because right. uh, it's a sensitive issue. Uh, also, uh, you know, fans of Bipin Rawat who oh, yes. only saw the clip we put out, they were up in arms and like, how can you say this? And I said, Are bhaiya, please watch the whole episode. You will see what we were really talking about. So yeah, yeah. it was, it. Uh, you know, if, if podcasts can go viral, this one definitely did. did. Yes, exactly. Uh, and our listeners and viewers, can you just go back to our previous episode? Episode and just check out what uh, Shiv is talking about in case you haven't uh, already uh, heard it or watched it. Uh, you know, Shiv, before we move the topic of the day, uh, I also want to go to the, a few comments that we got uh, for, on, on our previous episode. Uh, and I want to kind of clear the air because it's a sort of a controversial topic. A uh, few people, uh, some of our listeners, some of our viewers wanted us to talk about uh, the so-called failure and uh, for those listening to us again I've made air quotes of this missile called R-73 uh, it was uh, displayed or used during the Vayu Shakti uh, air um, uh, exercise that's going yeah. on or that happened over the weekend I think or the weekend before uh, nothing reported in mainstream media. There were some reports uh, on social media, some handles. I don't know what those handles were, but claiming that the missile was a failure because there were two uh, platforms that were used to fire it. The Samar, which is an anti-air 
aircraft yeah. I mean, uh, system and the tejas fighter jet uh, i'm not sure exactly what happened but they've seen the clip uh, of the announcer basically saying that it was a small drone and the missile flew very close and if it was a large aircraft it would have hit to which some people commented saying oh nice save by the commentator mm. so again i don't know what happened so you yeah. know as you uh, defense journalist someone who knows about this just clear the air what's it all so, about so so yeah so so the r73 most definitely missed okay. uh, you know on on this podcast we don't mince our words uh, you know no woolly explanations we tell it straight uh, that missile which was fired by the jet definitely missed the target drone uh, which uh, if you look at it technically uh, it's uh, not really a big deal if you ask the air force you ask uh, fighter pilots about a missile hitting a target uh, uh, you know the 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 realistic and genuine answer to that is in a war fighting scenario you're not uh, armed with just one missile there will be and very likely will be situations where missiles will miss their targets because targets have countermeasures evasive uh, options etc uh, so a missile hitting a target is not such a big deal uh, uh, not only does a single aircraft carry many missiles potentially but you also have many aircraft in the air so it's not like one aircraft one missile one target and that's it if you fail that's it that's not how combat works on the other hand vayu shakti was a firepower demonstration uh, so it was very much about spectacle it right. was very much about uh, uh, you know visually showing you what uh, these aircraft and these weapons can actually do there is always the possibility of uh, uh, you know a, a margin of error the possibility of a missile missing so i think it was just unfortunate for the air force that in this particular set that particular mm. item in what was otherwise a spectacularly uh, you know well executed firepower demonstration that the missile missed and it became a talking point the r73 is a a soviet era missile that is um, uh, you know a standard uh, uh, you know sort of heat seeking missile mm. that's uh, there on all of our uh, all uh, a standard air to air missile I beg your pardon that's there on all of our uh, nearly all of our um, uh, you know russian aircraft and therefore uh, you know to use that one one incident to uh, say that it was a failure uh, you know one doesn't really know what happened one will have to go into the actual details but uh, i wouldn't read that much into it hmm, right uh, just did a, did a quick check uh, uh, so the vayu shakti was held over the uh, over pokhran yeah. uh, which is going to be closely linked to what we talk about which yeah. is uh, india's nuclear program uh we briefly touched upon this i think uh, in the initial uh, days of season 2 when we discussed the various conflicts uh, facing the world israel hamas uh, russia ukraine india china standoff and the possibility of yeah. a nuclear nuclear war in the modern day and age uh, we'll delve much uh, deeper into those topics uh, but first let's take an overview of india's nuclear program uh, it began i think in the late 40s so late like yeah, late 40s early 50s uh, with the with the launch of the atomic energy commission uh, under homi baba and i think the first nuclear test was done in 1974 75 yeah uh that was supposed to be a civilian demonstration of india being able to sort of you know create nuclear energy and i think back then the idea <laughs> was that we will be using this technology for energy needs and not really for military needs uh that kind of changed i think in the 80s and 90s the shift which is where i'd like you to focus on the shift towards uh thinking of using nuclear power as a, a military asset and i think in uh, 1998 yeah. operation shakti uh, i think around five uh, nuclear explosions were carried out in pokhran Uh, under uh, prime minister tel bihari vajpay uh, one of the crowning jewels of the bjp so to speak they keep bringing it up all the time that you know we were the ones who kind of gave india nuclear uh, nuclear uh, military power and since then you've had a range of equipment you've had the agni series 1 to 5 i think all in uh, all in operation the uh, 6 being developed you have the k15 k4 and k5 uh, submarine submarine missiles uh, you have the aryan the aryan gat uh, nuclear powered uh, nuclear uh, submarine Uh, you have i think the mirages and jaguars which are able to launch yeah. nuclear missiles and i'm also getting rafael yes modern right. which should be <clears throat> and a range of road uh, or road uh, uh, transport vehicles basically that can carry and fire nuclear missiles uh before like i said we'll get we we go into uh, everything else a brief overview of how did we go about developing this uh, and uh, why in the 80s and 90s did we feel the need to go nuclear military speaking so uh, you know like we've discussed in many uh, you know earlier episodes as well uh, i think in the 80s and 90s there was a geopolitical awakening in india uh, that we were uh, uh, you know much bigger than we had initially imagined this was uh, not just a bigger country but a country with far greater global potential 
Uh, this was a country that was, uh, uh, you know, in some simplistic ways, a rising star in the global community, but also a country that was, uh, you know, had fought a few wars, had an economy that had just been liberalized, uh, you know, had, uh, uh, you know, th th there were many uh, 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 economic hot points about India that were extremely promising, the beginnings of the IT boom, etc. All of those things. This predates what happened in the 90s, but uh, it was, uh, it was uh, something that foretold uh, uh, you know, the greatness that India would uh, achieve uh, later on. Uh, very much as part of all of this uh, in, you know, uh, in, in the 90s, uh, obviously there was a systemic realization, Dave, that, uh, you know, a country like India faced with the challenges that it does, an unpredictable neighbor in the West in the form of Pakistan, an even more unpredictable neighbor in the East in the form of China, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the entire AQ Khan network, mm. Uh, which has, uh, you know, uh, funneled dirty nuclear technology to India's enemies everywhere. Uh, uh, you know, the sheer opacity of, uh, you know, who holds what uh, and, uh, you know, whether it can fall into the wrong hands. All of that, uh, you know, which uh, now sounds very Hollywood, w were real fears at that point of time. Uh, and uh, the, the greatness of what happened was uh, that... Uh, uh, th that the government uh, under uh, under Atal Bihari Vajpayee with with that famous secrecy, well, you know, yes. practically nobody knew. There was one journalist who reported about it a day ahead. Uh, you know, conducted these tests because I think there was a there was a a pan a pan system realization that uh, this is a country that needs to be able to protect itself, uh, and it needs to be able to protect itself not just through conventional military power which it has already used in a series of uh, conflicts and wars already, but it needs to have deterrent power, uh, which is to prevent conflict, uh, you know, prevent large-scale, uh, you know, uh, uh, attacks on its uh, territory, uh, uh, you know, and uh, basically deter uh, either Pakistan or China or basically these two countries, but any other country from even thinking about, mm. uh, you know, doing something to harm Indian sovereignty. Uh, and that's the reason. So, the, the, so, so to get down to the nuts and bolts of a nuclear program, uh, the, the, you know, all nuclear programs are basically about two things. One of them is to uh, figure out where your nuclear mm. uh, fuel is going to come from for your bomb. The second is to actually build a bomb, build a warhead. Uh, the third is to actually test that warhead, and and these are not these are not logical consequential steps. They're all each of them highly specialized areas of nuclear science. Uh, so you you know you may be a country that has a lot of uranium two thirty five or you know whatever fuel you're going to use in the bomb, but you may not be able to enrich it. Uh, you may be able to enrich it, but you may not be able to uh, uh, you know uh, actually build a device. You may be able to build a device, but you may not be able to test it. So these are all extremely difficult things. Uh, but in uh, 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 like you rightly pointed out, because India had started early in terms of, uh, you know, atomic energy, it had know-how, the, the the entire legacy of Baba, or Homi Baba, and, and hundreds of other men and women scientists uh, as part of India's, uh, you know, nuclear program, uh, all of that uh, amazingly sort of telescoped into the late 90s, where India was able to successfully uh, test, I think, five, yes. five devices in Pokhran. Pokhran is a vast field firing range in the Thar Desert in Rajasthan. Uh, and those were successful tests. So that proved that we had warheads that were capable of nuclear destruction. These are weapons of mass destruction. The, uh, the, the, the good thing was th the second challenge for any nuclear program was something that was already underway since the, since the late 70s, early 80s, which is something you mentioned, which is India's delivery program yes. uh, in the form of what was called the IGMDP or the Integrated Guided Missile Development Program under the Defense Research and Development Organization. Uh, APJ Abdul Kalam, before him, uh, you know, many other scientists, the rocket boys as they were called, uh, you know, they were building these highly reliable workhorse uh, ballistic missile uh, families like the Agni, the Prithvi, etc. The Prithvi is conventional, but the Agni has uh, uh, was initially, uh, you know, developed not as a nuclear delivery okay. platform. It was built as a, as a normal conventional uh, ballistic missile platform, but uh, 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 aligned with India's nuclear ambitions, uh, the, the 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 missile program realized. Uh, to its great delight that it did not need to, to waste time developing a completely separate family of delivery systems for what for for the warheads that had been tested because the agni agni series worked just fine in terms of weight in terms of uh, you know tonnage in terms of range they these things fit uh, perfectly uh, and the beauty of the agni series of missiles uh, was uh, uh, is uh, the fact that they are modular which meant that 
uh, extending the range of Agni missiles uh, meant, you know, just strapping on a couple of extra phases to the missiles. Oh, I'm, I'm, as usual, simplifying, simplifying it, but it, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it didn't mean starting from scratch. So, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so some of the Agni missiles are different from each other, but in general, the longer range missiles like the three, four, uh, the, the three, five, and uh, and the six. Uh, are all basically the same system with uh, additional phases, etc., with with better technology. So that part was uh, taken care of. Uh, the, the 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 so that was the that, that was the uh, land launched component of India's nuclear uh, uh, program. The the second was the air launched, which you mentioned the Mirages, the Jaguars, uh, and the Rafals. I'd actually broken the story about how uh, India had stipulated during the uh, its negotiations with France for the Rafals. Uh, that nuclear delivery has to be one of the capabilities. Okay. Uh, and this was very, very, uh, 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 it was a touchy topic for obvious reasons, because this is a government-to-government mili -government military deal. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, as far as my information is concerned, France said, you know, you're already operating mirages mm. uh, and, and using them for nuclear delivery. That's not our concern. You're using them for your strategic, uh, uh, you know, uh, options, etc. So uh, it's not something we need to contract. If you want to sling on nuclear weapons to your Rafals, that's entirely up to you. You are the owners of the Rafals. So the Rafals are capable of carrying nuclear weapons. Uh, so that's your air delivered component. The third leg of this nuclear triad, as it's called, is the most important one. And the one that India achieved last for, for understandable yes. reasons. And that's because it's the most complicated and difficult to achieve because it involves uh, a nuclear submarine platform, which India did not have uh, of its own, uh, and uh, they've. Uh, I was lucky enough to be one of the one of the I think forty journalists uh, uh, during the UPA. I think it was either two thousand eight or two thousand nine, uh, who w was flown down to Vishakhapatnam to a secret facility called the Shipbuilding Center. Uh, no, uh, this was the pre phone camera age anyway, but there were no cameras allowed anywhere. There was one PIB camera guy who took. Three photographs which have now become public where you can barely see anything. Yeah. Uh, it has a picture of Gursharan Kaur, the wife yes, of the then yes. Prime Minister, breaking a coconut yes. on the submarine. And that was the Arihant, uh, India's first uh, ballistic missile, nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarine, uh, uh, which then entered service a few years later. And now, like you said, the Arighat is the second submarine. And uh, there are many more that are going to be coming yeah. online. So to be very clear, the, 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 the submarine leg of the triad uh, has been the most difficult one to achieve because, like I said, it involved building a submarine that's not only nuclear powered, but capable of staying, uh, you know, underwater and uh, wielding, brandishing these missiles for long periods of time, uh, you know, potentially, uh, you know, months or even years, uh, uh, you know, on sort of silent patrol in the seas. Uh, and therefore, now we can say India's nuclear uh, triad is complete. Our nuclear program is complete. Uh, in terms of the formulas, in terms of the policies, the you know the famous no first use policy, <laughs> which we mentioned a couple of episodes yeah. ago, in terms of how Manohar Parikar had once wondered uh, why we had a no first use policy, uh, you know all those things then fell into place, and then by the uh, you know by the uh, sort of the the first decade of the new millennium, the two thousand, the two, first decade of the two thousands. Um, you know, things were, everything had sort of fallen into place. The, uh, you know, the Strategic Forces Command, which we talked about in our last episode, that became a reality post Cargill. Uh, and then you had your nuclear command structure. So that's where things are at now. Yeah. Uh, just a slight seg segue, because I'm guessing this uh, area is going to keep coming up a lot more uh, on in our, in our defense, Pokhran. Yeah. What is it about this place in Rajasthan that is just like, you know, your... It's your thing for every firing test you want to do, whether it's a, you know, I think they even have a normal firing, yeah. bombing range, for example, etc. You've obviously been there. Tell us about this desert land. So, so, so the Thar Desert obviously is a, is a optimal for weapons uh, testing and uh, ranging and firing because uh, it's, just a, it's just a hellscape of an open area. It's a desert. There's no habitation, uh, you know, very little habitation is uh, just on the fringes. Uh, and you've just got uh, this fabulous open space to uh, test even long range uh, missiles, air to air missiles, drop bombs and things like that. So the Thar Desert is, of course, if you look at it on Google Maps, it's huge. Uh, so and it's big enough to actually have two large firing ranges. Okay. One of them is called the... Uh, uh, the Pokhran Field Firing Range, the other one is called the Mahajan Field Firing Range. They're both in the Thar Desert. 
uh, I'm not sure about the comparison in terms of size, but they're both massive and uh, they both uh, provide the Army, Navy, Air Force, whoever wants to use them, uh, uh, you know, a huge amount of flexibility in terms of which direction they want to fire, whether they want to, uh, you know, uh, uh, create bunkers and uh, test devices, uh, subterranean devices like they mm. did with uh, the Shakti series in uh, 1998 under Vajpayee. Uh, to conduct uh, the Vayu Shakti exercises where you've got aircraft flying at uh, rapid speeds and dropping uh, devices. Uh, so uh, these are uh, these are very, very valuable field firing ranges. A lot of artillery testing also mm. takes place here. Uh, before before Balakot, uh, you know, the, 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 the penetration charges of some of those bombs were tested in oh, Pokhran okay. on concrete structures uh, to test, uh, you know, penetration devices are basically uh, bombs which are fitted with fuses where uh, the bomb doesn't hit on impact. It penetrates through the first resistance mm. or twice. It can be programmed for that and explodes only after it gets in. So it doesn't necessarily just damage the building, but goes inside and kills whoever's inside. So mm. that's what happened in the Balakot airstrikes yep. as well. Those were tested in Pokhran. So uh, 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 in terms of field firing ranges, Pokhran and Mahajan are extremely crucial. Uh, uh, the, 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 Navy, uh, the Navy conducts a lot of its uh, uh, firepower um, testing, etc., obviously off the coast. So if the Navy has to test uh, any of its naval weaponry, they do it either in the Bay of Bengal or in the Arabian Sea. Right. Uh, you know, Ship, when I was researching for this episode, uh, and as you were describing the history of India's nuclear program, one thing struck me as quite different uh, mm. from every military program that we've discussed so far on this on this podcast and that we will in the future, is that it is not riddled with controversies at all. It just seems like this clockwork precession that you took steps, took steps, and tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, you got what you wanted. You had the atomic test. You've had the series of... You've had, like, five nuclear missiles and this is and I literally grew up like it's I can recount because you know 1998 you have you've had the nuclear tests and then you've started developing these missiles and like clockwork you've got one two three four five the six is coming up you've got three missiles for the navy you've got two uh, everything is just set I could not find a single point of controversy nothing about delays like we've discussed with the rifle and the, and the fighter jet and the aircraft carrier etc is that really the case or is it because it's a nuclear program, there's lots of secrecy, so we don't, does, does not get reported out in the media? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, uh, you know, Dave, first of all, uh, we should be thankful that there are no controversies <laughs> or at least no known no controversies as far as India's nuclear program. Because remember, unlike China, Pakistan, North Korea in yeah. this region, uh, India is seen as a responsible nuclear power, uh, you know, a country that has developed weapons. Uh, only for self defense and not to not as an aggressor uh, etc so it's very important that uh, you know no part of this journey has been contentious or controversial on the other hand uh, look within 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 these nuclear programs i'm sure there may have been issues and fights and uh, you know controversies uh, regarding priorities and uh, uh, delays etc but the, the the beauty of the indian nuclear program has always been that uh, on all sides, there has been a near total secrecy as far as how things are being executed. Unlike, uh, you know, and I hate to compare us with Pakistan because uh, it's not only an unfair uh, comparison, but uh, it's uh, it, it would frankly disgust Indian nuclear scientists because uh, the, the nuclear program in Pakistan was filled with people who had, a, you know, who had a political slash religious slash anti-India agenda. Mm. It was not driven by, uh, you know, the the ideals of self-preservation and, uh, you know, a rising economy and uh, something to be protected. It was more about creating a more dangerous world. Uh, whereas India was about, uh, you know, acquiring weapons in order to actually create a more peaceful world. Because with these weapons, India would be keeping these other rogue nations in check because, uh, you know, like it or not, we're the only ones over here who have the power to do so. Uh, so uh, I imagine there would have been controversies, you know, and I'd love to at some someday, uh, you know, see something about it. But the amazing part about India's nuclear program is not one scientist, not one officer, not one not one man or woman who's been directly or indirectly associated with our nuclear program. Uh, many have written books, yes. many have written books, many have done interviews, but none of them have come out with anything, uh, you know, that would give anyone uh, an insight into did something go wrong? Mm. Uh, because, because all of them are completely and amazingly aware of how the smallest bits of information can provide 
you know, to to the right ears, intelligence about where the gaps may be, what technology we may not actually have, uh, mm. you know, uh, uh, whether India actually did have a particular piece of technology at one point of time. It can give them, uh, you know, timeline intelligence, which is very important in a development journey of a weapon system. Uh, so all of these things are uh, very admirable, ad admirable about India's uh, uh, program. I remember the uh, the uh, just a small example, which is that the 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 Arihant, which is India's uh, nuclear powered ballistic missile submarine, uh, used to be called for the longest time before it got its name uh, Arihant, and the name Arihant was broken by India Today magazine mm -hmm. by Sandeep Punithan yes. when he was here, my close friend and one of India's top defense journalists. Uh, but before that, for the longest time, it just had a working title of ATV, which was Advanced Technology Vessel, you know, which is your typical anodyne vanilla name. Uh, and, you know, I used, to, I used to love thinking, you know, they're calling it ATV, which is like the most most plain Jane yeah. name for something that is probably the most awesome thing that the Indian establishment has ever built. Uh, and, uh, and, and, that, and that was the kind of culture that our nuclear program uh, was really about. Uh, there was also a great deal of practicality in India's nuclear program, which was that we're not going to be able to do this entirely ourselves. Yes, we're going to be able to build, uh, you know, some of the core technologies, but we are going to need help. We didn't need help as far as the Agni systems were concerned. Mm. We didn't need help as far as the air del delivery systems were concerned. But for the submarine, we couldn't have done it without the Russians. Yes. That has to be said. Now, the Arihant itself, uh, uh, even now uh, and and earlier, especially in the, in the 2000s, if you... Uh, took a flight to Vishakhapatnam, the airport would be full of Russians all the time. Okay. There would be Russians everywhere. You would see Russians everywhere in the cantonment area because there were so many Russian engineers and scientists who were constantly flying in to be part of the ATV program, uh, which then became Arihant. So, uh, so uh, that's another great uh, thing about the nuclear program, which is that India was very practical about it. Uh, uh, India was absolutely sure that this was something that it needed to do itself. But when it realized that it was not going to be able to meet certain core technologies in a timely fashion. It did not hesitate to enlist Russia's support. And Russia, let's face it, was the only country that was going to be able to share those technologies with you. Now, of course, India is has independently mastered many of those technologies it depended on Russia for, which is why Arighat and many of the follow-on submarines, yes. they're building a class of uh, nuclear-powered attack submarines also. There's something called the... Uh, S3 or the S5, if I'm not mistaken. We did a uh, show on that recently, uh, which is a much larger ballistic missile submarine that's being built by India as well. Uh, so so now India is on its kind of, it's, it's an autopilot mode as far as the uh, submarine program is concerned. But uh, as far as controversies go, uh, yeah, few and far between. I don't think anybody really knows what really yeah. happened. Yeah. We, we, all of us journalists used to, uh, you know, there was a particular admiral from the Navy uh, who had uh, headed the ATV program famously. Uh, his name was Admiral G Ganesh. Mm. And even after his retirement, I remember journalists trying to harangue him and pursue him and try and get some juice from him about, you know, what was going on, what it was like and and that that code of professionalism in the nuclear program never never evaporated, which is a which is something that really deserves applause. Yeah, it does. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, just to give an example of what Shiv is talking about, uh, till this date, I think there are only three or four stock images of INS uh, on INS Arihant. Yeah, yeah. I know that for a fact because whenever we need to cover something to do with nuclear submarines, we try to find the latest photo and we just cannot find a photo. Yeah. And I think, in fact, there is not a single photo of INS Arihant out there. And also, in fact, I think INS Arigat was never formally announced to yeah, be out not there. announced, yeah. It was, I think, some innocuous Twitter handle that did some uh, satellite image. Data. Oh, there was some submarine over there like a few months ago. Now it's not there. Now it's over there. Oh, that means Arigat has moved out to sea. Yeah, yeah. So India has never formally said that uh, INS Arigat is out there. Uh, uh, Aryan was launched with much fan fanfare because it was obviously, uh, you know, a, a crowning sort of a right. glory moment for for India uh, that completed the nuclear triad, like you like you said, uh, which we'll uh, we'll come back to, but after a quick break. Meanwhile, if and when Shabazz Sharif takes over as Prime Minister, he will be, as we said, wearing a very pokey crown of thorns. That's because Pakistan's economy remains in a shambles. There has been a severe contraction in growth and the economy faces high public debt. The International Monetary Fund, or IMF, has projected that Pakistan's external debt will touch $130 billion in the current financial year. 
Pakistan's debt to GDP ratio now stands at an unsustainable 75%. Ironically, much of it is because of Imran Khan's mismanagement while he was in power, though the blame accrued to the PDM government that succeeded him. Inflation continues to hover at 40% and prices of all essentials, including fruits, vegetables and petrol, have soared. The Prime Minister will have to take, Shabazz Sharif or whoever succeeds uh, uh, after the negotiations, will have to take plenty of harsh measures for its economy to recover and this will no doubt be unpopular uh, and uh, certainly lead to protests on the streets. There is also a consensus that the country will have to enter into another restrictive uh, IMF support program almost immediately after it takes charge. A new round of privatization of state-owned white elephants such as the National Airline PIA and uh, Pakistan Steel Mills is also on the cards. This will cause plenty of labor resentment. The flailing economy and its recovery will then be the biggest test for the Sharif brothers. Now let's look at uh, the options of the all-powerful Pakistan army. There is, of course, a widespread uh, resentment of uh, political parties against the army. And Imran Khan's surprisingly good showing has challenged the army's dominance. But in the larger scheme of things, the split mandate could also be a godsend or good for the country's military political engineers since it allows them room to pressurize and uh, get the other political actors to behave in the manner that they think is appropriate for them. Welcome back. Uh, Shiv and I are discussing India's uh, nuclear program. Uh, Shiv, I want to to go to the buzzword nuclear triad. Uh, it's been there for quite a while. Uh, just like, you know, break it down for us. Uh, what is it? Why is it important? And the importance of having a submarine to complete it. And it, like, you know, why is it that a nuclear submarine, like the INS Arihant and its cousin or sister, sorry, INS Arihant, why is it so important? Uh, and uh, also uh, briefly about the fact that when INS Arihant was launched, uh, people incorrectly said that India had completed the nuclear triad because people forgot that when the submarine would be in maintenance, you would not actually have the triad. Right. So for you to be able to tri have a triad, you need to ensure that one nuclear submarine is constantly out there. So just take us to this buzzword nuclear triad, what it means and why is it so important? Yeah, so nuclear triad, uh, you know, like the like the phrase implies, it's a, a, a it's basically three elements of any uh, cogent and, uh, you know, effective nuclear deterrent uh, system. Uh, which is that you've got, uh, you know, like I explained in our first uh, interaction, which is that you've got a, a land-based uh, nuclear weapon uh, launch capability, which is in the form of your ballistic missiles. Uh, then you've got the air-launched capability, uh, which is basically a fighter aircraft or combat aircraft of another kind, carrying nuclear weapons and launching them uh, into enemy territory. And then you've got the third third leg, which is your sea leg. So it's basically land, sea, and air. That's what that's what the triad is all about in the most simplistic sense. The reason why they've the sea leg or the submarine leg is the most crucial is because the submarine leg, uh, if you look at it in the context of a nuclear exchange or a military exchange between two countries, that's the one leg that is most invulnerable. Okay. That's where that's where you can really hide your nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you're hiding your, uh, uh, you know, land-based systems uh, as a result of satellite imagery, as a result of, uh, you know, other kinds of intelligence, your enemy is going to know where your nuclear weapons are. Uh, uh, as far as your uh, uh, air-delivered deli nuclear weapons are concerned, similarly, your enemy already knows where your runways yep. are, where your airfields are, uh, and they, they probably have a rough sense of where your nuclear depots are, where your nuclear weapon systems are stored. So uh, I'm, I'm not saying they know, but I'm saying that in the event of an exchange, uh, these are identifiable targets. Your enemy can identify where your missiles are coming from or where your aircraft are taking off from. Therefore, those are visible, recognizable, quantifiable targets that can be destroyed, uh, you know, by counteractions. But when you are talking about a nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarine that's lurking anywhere between 80 and 200 meters below the surface of the sea, uh, moving very, very slowly, these are, these, are not, these are platforms that are not built for speed. They are built to lurk in total secrecy. They're almost completely noiseless. They're not trying to get from one place to another like attack submarines. Uh, they are literally there like silent sentinels of the deep. Uh, 
simply existing until they're called upon to do their uh, you know terrible job uh, uh, and uh, therefore who knows where they are it could be lurking somewhere in the bay of bengal or it could be lurking somewhere near maldives it could be lurking in the south indian ocean it could be lurking somewhere near australia who knows because it's a nuclear submarine and we're not telling people where we're going uh, so uh, even now how, how does anybody know where arihant or arigata they could be anywhere they could potentially literally be anywhere in any part of the world's oceans now uh, uh, obviously they're not going to be uh, they're not going to be venturing uh, you know ridiculously far yeah. away because uh, the 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 potential targets for a nuclear strike or counter strike in india's case are uh, let's be realistic about it there are two countries that we can potentially attack in in event of uh, hostility and those are the two countries we've just named pakistan and china uh, so uh, given the kinds of weapons that are uh, have already been tested which is the k15 which is a fairly short range weapon which is about 750 km range uh, weapon the k4 is a 3000 km range weapon the k5 is your sort of intercontinental range 5000 km range weapon which i understand is being tested or about to be tested uh, so these are uh, kind of dynamics that come into play for this kind of thing but the but the but the point about why the 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 the, the subsurface or the undersea nuclear element is the most important is because there might be hell happening on earth mm. above the sea surface two countries may be destroying each other but the country that has a subsurface nuclear capability still gets to have that last word or still gets to preempt total destruction by destroying that other country first because they they can destroy your airfields they can destroy your cities they can destroy Uh, and I, i'm just painting a kind of doomsday scenario i'm not saying this is how it will happen yeah. but the likelihood of them knowing where your arihant and arigat are uh, is is almost zero mm. it's almost completely zero because it's difficult uh, uh, it's 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 difficult even to know where ships are so imagine mm. uh, uh, you know uh, and th th this comes back to submarine warfare which is the reason why submarines you know try not to surface because you surface that's an intelligence you know, so. uh, uh, you know blip that goes out but and, and these are submarines that are built to st stay submerged literally indefinitely mm. and these are big unlike the submarines that we we've been talking about like our scorpions and our kilo classes these are big beefy submarines uh, that have much more space uh, you know are more comfortable you know because they're not they're not fighting machines these are these are these are machines of mass destruction you know if these uh, you know, again crimson tide comes to mind oh, yes. once again which is that if these if, if these if the submarine commander of arihant is called upon to do his work uh, then it's goodbye to all of us <laughs> okay uh, uh, the, the famous quote in that movie which is that uh, in the nuclear world the real enemy is war itself which is the truth because nobody wins in nuclear war mm. Uh, so 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 that's so that really explains to you the kind of dynamic as far as all these elements are concerned but the submarine element is uh, is crucial simply because it's out of sight cannot be detected cannot be tracked nobody knows where it's uh, it's it's at you might know where an agni is going to hit you from you might know where a rafale is going to take off from but you'll never know where an arihant's going to fire at you yeah uh, very very uh, nice way to illustrate uh, the that explanation uh uh let's move a bit uh, to the safety and uh, the structures around uh, india's uh, nuclear program uh, and by the way i think anna might complain but on this episode it's going to end up looking a, a more like me interviewing shiv but th that subject is such you know the subject is so secretive that you know even i don't have a lot of knowledge about it and he with his you know uh, two decades of experience covering the defense will definitely have uh, a lot more information so sorry anna about that but you know please bear with that but i think the answers he's giving up very very uh, you know informative so uh, that's that uh, yeah so moving to the safety structure the command structure of india's nuclear program i have some overview of it that you have the strategic forces command uh, headed by i'm guessing a lieutenant general level uh, yeah, officer three star officer three star yeah. officer who reports not to the respective service chief but uh, i mean they do in some way or the other but the operational reporting is to the government directly yeah. through the cabinet secretary which is basically the pmo uh, there is i think the i forgot the full, the the name for it the css or something the hmm. nss i'm i'm sorry the I forgot uh, which includes the prime minister the national security advisor and a few others yeah, i think yeah. it also involves the the military chiefs the I national security wrong. council which has all of NSES, these yeah. then nss yeah. that's the prime authority yeah. uh, who has the power to 
order a order yes. a nuclear attack whether it's through land air or the sea uh obviously i mean you won't know or you even if you do you might not be able to give us the whole exact scenario of how a nuclear strike would, would be carried out if it would would be carried out but obviously it's a nerd question that everyone would want to know about right so if it were to happen what would it look like and you know second just like a, a slight tangent uh, i just remember a controversy actually about the nuclear program not exactly about the nuclear program but like, like a tangential co- controversy because it involves the brahmos which on paper is not a nuclear missile but there's a lot of speculation on internet that it is nuclear capable mm. like if you wanted to you could attach a nuclear warhead to it and you know if i think about it it makes sense it's just like a warhead right a nuclear warhead is more or less like a normal warhead in terms of shape size etc so a missile that can carry a warhead can obviously carry a nuclear warhead what am i talking about the controversy a few months back i think around a year there was a misfiring yeah two years ago uh, two years ago uh misfiring that you know sadly speaking we had icona face because mm. you just not want to be seen as a country that can end up accidentally firing a ballistic missile into uh, a foreign country that happened in pakistan so yeah just like thought of that randomly while talking about safety structures command yeah. etc so yeah that's what i want to discuss with you so, yeah. tell us about this so so uh, since you brought up the brahmos thing uh, yeah we india definitely had icon its face it was a, a strategic embarrassment uh, you know because it was apparently a missile being maintained and it ac- yeah. a- accidentally got activated and it landed somewhere in pakistan but uh, we may have had egg on our face and uh, uh, officers in india were punished yes. and court martialed for it but there uh, in my view and i'm not being facetious about this there was even greater egg on pakistan's face because they had no idea about this missile yeah. this missile came and landed somewhere in the hinterland of pakistan uh, and they didn't even really know about it until it was a uh, mm. kind of reported which means their radars their air defense all their tracking uh, you know tracking systems etc had absolutely no clue that uh, you know the, the country that they've sworn to destroy has fired a supersonic cruise missile straight into your territory and yeah, you had absolutely no clue yeah. about it so so it actually made them look way worse than we it, for us it looked terrible it was like unprofessional incompetence for them it looked like oh my god what have you spent all this money on yeah. if you can't even detect a missile let's put that part aside but you're right it it, it does show that there are concerns as far as military uh, equipment safety is concerned uh now to quickly differentiate between uh, you know uh, a nuclear attack and a military attack because these are two very different things uh, we, uh, you know i'm sure our listeners already know but it bears repeating that uh, you know nuclear power is not military power mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know military power is very much in the realm of conventional in terms of uh, in terms of defending in terms of uh, you know uh, holding ground in terms of uh, you know uh, you know fighting or or, or you know uh, uh, affecting or executing military objectives uh, in a small place nuclear weapons by their very very nature are mass destructive yeah. they have a strategic effect and the very purpose of uh, you know, the, the true success of nuclear weapons is if they never need yeah. to be used right uh, the whole point of nuclear weapons is that the their presence is enough to to prevent conflict so if if nuclear weapons begin being used then they've already failed yep. to do their primary job which is to prevent conflict right so so that's the amazing nuclear paradox of uh, the nuclear world which is that uh, you know the, the moment you hit that launch button those weapons have basically announced their entire failure that they have they have proven to be completely pointless by preventing uh, you know a mass destructive war for the world now the question you ask which is uh, you know how does it all work if there's a nuclear attack uh, now this has always been a very tantalizing question the, the 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 answer you know the answer is exciting but it's also not that exciting you mm-hmm. know like like everything in this world uh, you know there is a mundane layer to everything you know one would love to imagine that a guy in a suit is running with a briefcase <laughs> through a dark co- you know a <laughs> corridor with intermittent lights uh, you know and is banging on a door and he needs to get one person's approval then another person's approval and then you know three people have to say the same code word in unison and only then a missile can be launched uh, you know i i would love it for it to be something like that but unfortunately these things are all you know are ultimately about executive decisions yeah. uh, uh you know th- uh, the 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 president of india is the supreme commander of the armed forces so there is a presidential element as far as uh, uh the use of nuclear power is concerned but like with most things to do with the president it's a it's a formality yeah. kind of thing uh, 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 the use of nuclear weapons is an executive decision uh, by the government 
the the national security council has to obviously unanimously approve the use of uh, nuclear weapons uh, so this involves the national security the prime minister obviously the national security advisor the defense minister uh, uh, you know uh, the, the intelligence chiefs the service chiefs the strategic forces commander all of them are aligned but the decision is finally the prime minister as the as the executive yep. of the country he decides on whether nuclear weapons uh, can and will be used remember no first use policy so the only time as per our stipulated uh, and legislated policy is that india cannot fire a nuclear will, uh, i shouldn't say cannot but will not fire a nuclear weapon until an enemy nuclear weapon has landed on yeah. our territory uh, now now we don't know if that that can actually change but uh, but once uh, you know look at it like this once a nuclear weapon lands on our territory if it's at some in them. some some scenario then it it triggers a a very very rapid chain of command where the strategic forces command the national security council and the military uh, align in a pre pre prescribed way this is already already known it's not like if a nuclear missile lands nobody will know what to do it's not like that there's a very very clear chain of command and a, a chain of uh, approvals that will be required that happen very very quickly digitally obviously encrypted uh, where uh, uh, india will respond and uh, now since a scenario of this kind has never happened and is hopefully unlikely to ever happen uh, nobody knows what india's response time will be will it be a matter of a few minutes will it be a matter of a few hours will it be less than an hour there has always been very tantalizing speculation about what this will be and now i in my fantasy world like to think it would be like 10 15 mm. minutes maximum because uh, because why would you wait for longer if someone's attacked you with a nuclear weapon right but uh, obviously you have to first judge whether it was a nuclear yes. weapon you know uh, you have to know what the impact is because you also remember have to commit resources into protecting your yep. people guarding your cities uh, so all of those things will also be triggered so remember that when if and when india is uh, hit by a nuclear weapon it's not just about hitting back it's also about preserving your country you have to safeguard your cities uh, uh, figure out uh, you know how many people you can save uh the 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 the, the, the nbc the nuclear biological chemical mm. response that will be there at the attack site and then the response uh, as far as the country is concerned so uh, yeah the the fun answer is that there will be this uh, you know a, an attack will trigger this you know crazy never before kind of system which i should tell you is war gamed every single year okay it's war gamed all the time because it's it, it, it's part of the system of you know the strategic forces command uh it's uh it, it, the, the the it's it's raison d'etre it's it's uh, the, the very purpose of its existence is uh that it never needs to be Used. activated yeah. okay uh, everyone will pray that the sfc never needs to be activated mm. uh but what do they do in the meantime practice practice and that's what they do yeah uh, right uh, i think uh, that should uh, give uh, every uh, nerd out there the the answer that we were looking for and just to like you know build on that point there's also always this speculation whenever you have the prime minister traveling and uh, the photos of the spg guys are with him go i love and, this question yeah people are like oh nuclear football nuclear football because that's what a briefcase of the us president is called a nuclear football which actually does by the way contain apparently the nuclear launch codes for the us uh, nuclear system India में तो नहीं है ना ऐसा नहीं नहीं there's no such thing I'm sure there is some kind of a system of course, of course. Uh, remember that the, the the prime minister travels in uh, not just a completely integrated uh, cavalcade which has the capacity to become a mini PMO yes. for all practical purposes including ordering strategic or conventional uh, you know uh, actions. Uh, so it, th that is definitely that may not be in the form of a football or a briefcase but that capability is there including in his aircraft wherever he travels he's always uh, you know there's a there's a redundancy mm. that allows the prime minister to execute all of the things that may be uh, required of him including defending the country uh, but those famous uh, little briefcases you see carried by the uh, uh, by the uh, special protection group the spg officers uh, are actually uh, fold out ballistic shields those are uh, basically for the close protection of the prime minister and uh, you know a, a, a guy like narendra modi who loves going out into the crowd <laughs> stepping out of his yeah. car uh, you know and being with the people uh, so they, that's why those have become much more visible now because uh, basically if in the in 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 the event that there is some kind of an attack 
uh, or if bullets fly, God mm-hmm. forbid, of any, something like that. Uh, these shields basically fold out to the full length of the human body, uh, and they're and they're made of Kevlar and uh, carbon fiber, etc. And they're basically bulletproof shields, which are used to sort of create a fortress around the the protectee. In this case, the prime minister, and therefore protect him for, from any kind of incoming fire. So it's not a nuclear football. <laughs> it's just a plane, no electronics involved. Yeah. It's just a ballistic shield. It's also pretty cool, by the way. It's very cool. It's, it's very cool. cool. Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, and it's heavy. <laughs> of course, must be. <clears throat> that reminds me, I think we should do a special episode on SPG. We will, we should. Point, yes. Point, yeah. yes. Uh, right. Uh, so as we bring this episode to a close, we've discussed the history. We've discussed where we are at uh, in terms of current capabilities. Uh, What's there for us in the future? Two tangents over there. One in terms of the equipment that we are about to get. You mentioned, we mentioned, talked about Arihant Arigat. Arihant, uh, by the way, always was supposed to be a demonstrative uh, sort of piece of technology. Not really, I mean, of course, it's meant to, meant to be used yeah. in the seas. But I remember when it was launched, the government had said this is to demonstrate that we are capable uh, enough of building yeah. a nuclear nuclear submarine, uh, like Shiv mentioned, with some Russian help. Uh, and in fact, you know, you mentioned Sandeep Punithan. He had written a piece in the magazine in 2017, if I'm not wrong. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. It's a fantastic piece. Yeah. It's old now, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. But still, it gives you a very good overview of nuclear, uh, sorry, India's uh, nuclear submarine Nobody has written uh, more or better or in greater depth about India's nuclear submarine program than Sandeep yeah. in India today. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. In which he talks about, you know, what Shiv said about Russian help. Basically, I think Russians kind of helped Indians figure out how to make the nuclear reactor small enough to fit it on a submarine because submarine right. obviously limited space, right? So, anyway. So, yeah. So, we've got Gadigat. We've got, I think, two or three more coming yeah. up. Yeah. Uh, uh, similar class, but like uh, Shiv mentioned, larger in yes. size. Uh, we've got the Agni 6 under development, if I'm not wrong. I think a few test launches have, have happened. Uh, there was also an Agni P if I'm not wrong, hmm. launched a test launched a few few years ago. Uh, so yeah, in terms of equipment, what are we getting? Uh, what advancements do happen in the field of nuclear technology? Or do you think this is done? You know, the US ne bomb banaya, that's it. Fat boy, whatever it's called. I forgot the other name. Uh, that's the technology that we are, with, it's been there for the last 50 years. Are, are there advancements happening? So with missiles, yeah, obviously there is strike range capability. Agni-6 will fly much, much uh, farther away. But at the core essence, is nuclear technology, that's it. Ho gaya. No, it's definitely not it's 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 definitely an evolving technology because uh, because uh, the, the 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 of of uh, one main reason dave which is the paradigm of something called a tactical nuke uh, now a oh, tactical yes, we nuke to talk about this yeah, all, yeah. so you know, it's a good thing you brought it up because uh, the, the the era of tactical nukes has completely changed the game a tactical nuke unlike a you know the a nuclear weapon in the in the sense that we think of it uh, is not like a you know a huge world destroying mm. weapon of mass destruction that will destroy an entire country tactical nuke is a small nuclear warhead a short range weapon system uh, you know fired into your enemy country to create a limited amount of damage but it's still nuclear damage it's it's heavy duty damage but it's it's limited in terms of it not having like a it's it's not a wmd now when you're when you're talking about that level of nuclear uh, technology it brings an entire new paradigm of threat mm. uh, which is that so uh, if someone fires a tactical nuke into india do i still respond by destroying that country uh, or do i need to calibrate that as well and have my own tactical nukes you brought up the possibility of the brahmos carrying uh, you know a nuclear warhead uh, you know the, the the conventional wisdom on that would be why would i need a nuclear warhead on a 300 kilometer range missile uh, you know when i have a kilo, uh, you know, thousand and five thousand and six thousand range missiles, and that is exactly for this reason. Theoretically, you can easily sling on, uh, you know, a tactical nuclear warhead to a Brahmos. Now, if India uh, uh, sort of embraces the possibility of tactical nukes being used in future uh, battles that don't become all-out nuclear exchanges, then uh, you know, th- then we're talking about an entirely new. Uh, nuclear age. Uh, Princeton University did a did a simulation of how the U- Russia Ukraine conflict uh, could become a global nuclear war, mm. uh, and amazingly, it began with Russia firing tactical nukes at uh, at uh, NATO targets in places like Poland and and elsewhere. As a result of these countries, uh, you know, sending aircraft mm. or other uh, equipment into Ukraine. So they not a large scale, but tactical nukes. So and uh, in response, these NATO countries respond with tactical nukes. There's a gradual escalation. 
then Russia, which is the more unpredictable of the lot, fires a weapon of mass destruction at one of these countries because it believes that a bigger attack mm. is coming. And then it's a it's a frightening simulation that begins between Russia and Ukraine and then ends in, you know, trident, uh, long-range ballistic missiles carrying nuclear warheads, the most, uh, the most destructive weapons of all time being launched by the United States into, into Russia and Russia firing them back. Wow. Into the United States End and basically world. destroying the End world. The world yeah. uh, so, 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 tactical nukes is where it could easily begin. Yeah. Uh, since we are on the topics of tactical nukes and I kind of forgot to talk about them, does Pakistan have them yet? Because the way I see it, uh, India would want to develop or invest in developing them if either Pakistan or China is seen to be going towards that that part. Do either of them have? Look, it? Uh, you know, with Pakistan and China, the the, the I, I'm sure our intelligence agencies know, but the the the, the conventional wisdom as far as these countries is con, uh, are concerned is that go with the assumptions that they either have it okay. or they're going to get it. Hmm. Uh, that's the conventional wisdom as far as these two countries are concerned because they will do whatever they can in terms of weaponry to acquire increased leverage against you. They they will try and get what you don't have. India currently has the Brahmos, which is a supersonic cruise missile. Uh, travels at four and a half times the speed of sound. Neither Pakistan nor China have that. To beat that kind of capability, I'm just taking this as an example, they will try, need to try and come up with some other, uh, you know, kind of capability. I'm not saying tactical nukes is the response to that. But what I mean in terms of a kind of multi-layered arms race, capability race, they will need to try and get that kind of leverage. So the conventional wisdom as far as India's... Uh, you know, intelligence strategy of what China and Pakistan has is either they have it or they're going to try and get it. Hmm. That's it. Right. Uh, right. Uh, as we close this episode, uh, one last point and thought about the worry of nuclear proliferation from Pakistan. And it's a serious concern in my head. Uh, you know, this is not a, a moment of Pakistan bashing for me. Uh, I'll just like, you know, I'm, I've, we've been covering Pakistan for a while on the desk, on the online desk, because of events that have been happening in the yeah. recent couple of years. Imran Khan being in jail, the recent elections full of controversies. Uh, you have the country literally begging uh, different agencies for money because of which it has had to crack down on terrorism to show that, you know, we are, you know, on the same page as you, so please give us money because of which there have been internal conflicts yeah. now. There are terror groups fighting amongst each other within Pakistan. There is friction between the military establishment and the terror groups over there. Seriously speaking, for Indian intelligence agencies, discussions bet between agencies uh, within India and with uh, agencies of, of the West, has this topic in your knowledge ever come up of the risk of Pakistan's nuclear weapons falling into the wrong hands? Because I think for me as a layperson, as, as a journalist who observes this from the desk in, in New Delhi, it looks like a valid threat. No, it's been, it's been a valid threat for a very long time. Uh, you know, ever since Pakistan's, uh, and I repeat this point, uh, you know the 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 dirty nuclear and and I mean dirty in the nuclear sense. Uh, you know the the dirty manner in which uh, you know nuclear trade was conducted by Pakistan under the famous AQ Khan network, Abdul Qadir Khan network, uh, where uh, uh, you know where uh, illicit nuclear technologies and uh, know how were uh, you know traded uh, traded illegally between uh, Pakistan, China, North Korea, uh, etc. Uh, is something that India has had on its radar for a very long time. So India's suspicions that uh, nuclear weapons or uh, nuclear capabilities would fall into the wrong hands are hardly unfounded. Those are very real uh, threats. And like you said, with a country that is in free fall politically, economically and otherwise, uh, you know, the fears of uh, structures there breaking down are, uh, are uh, very real. Uh, add to that the point that uh, these terror groups are not some you know, random Feran wearing jihadis mm -hmm. sitting in caves in mountains, uh, but very much aligned with your military, trained by the military, uh, uh, you know, functioning uh, almost like militaries in cities in Pakistan. And this is not an exaggeration. Uh, you know, outfits like the Jaish and the uh, and the Lashkar e Taiba are, are basically quasi military organizations. Uh, who is to say that they are not being trained in how to use? Uh, nuclear weapons. I'm I, I'm not making a comic book point. I'm just saying that uh, you know all of this has to go into India's own matrix of 
uh you know a uh, threat scenario I, you know any any country's intelligence uh, scenario matrix probably reads at some level like a comic book like a dhruv kamando comic book and uh, you know has many far fetched things about it but uh, those are the responsibilities of a country to account for every possibility and for a country like pakistan which uses terror as state policy which has been the kind of fountain head of uh, many global a uh, terrorist including osama bin laden let's never forget uh, you know the the possibility of such tech falling into the hands of powerful terrorists is is not beyond is not some fantasy scenario uh, and therefore it's very much within india's uh, you know threat uh, threat perspective and how it sees things mm -hmm. right all right one last quick point uh, just your personal thoughts on this uh, we kind of discussed this in a previous episode so i don't want to delve into it completely the so called uh, no, no first use policy one like always wondered like kya farak padta hai isn't like is it it's not legally binding like if you violate the no first use policy no one's going to take you to the icj or like the supreme court of india like oh my god you had the no first use policy but you lost a nuclear uh, device on, on on your on your own so what's the point of having this no first use policy or is it just a sort of like you know india wanting to be seen as a responsible power which like we've discussed on several episodes now it is being seen regardless of whether you have a no first use policy or not yet you've had ministers uh, uh Manohar Parikar, you talked about in a previous episode. Rajnath Singh, I think three, four years ago, when the standoff with China was going on, made a innocuous, not innocuous actually, made a statement at some event somewhere, uh, where he basically said that you know India's no first use policy depends on the circumstances. Basically, I think on some something on the lines of it can change with circumstances. Yeah. But then he also, I think, gave a clarification later on, and I think the MEA when it was asked in the press conference of a couple of weeks later, it said, "You know, it stays." your personal thoughts what's the point of having something like yeah. this does it serve us any purpose and uh, on a serious note has there ever in your knowledge been a serious discussion within the government whether it's the upa or the nda of actually tinkering with the no first use policy okay so so first to be very very clear india's no first policy is uh, uh, you know is is hugely beneficial to india uh, it was a very it was a very uh, meticulously thought through policy it wasn't you know just some random aman ki aasha type mm. uh, thing uh, you know in a in a in a world uh, where india happens to be the only nuclear power with a stated official no first use policy uh, makes india enormously unique in many ways and uh, uh, on the one hand it basically sends out the signal that india has invested in nuclear technology delivery systems and testing only for defense and deterrence and not for aggression mm. and not for the destruction of another country unless threatened to do so point number 2 uh, in a in a region where uh, which is world famous for uh, dirty nuclear tech thanks to the axis of uh, pakistan china and north korea uh, having a stated no first use policy uh, you know separates us from that from mm. that from that horrible axis and <laughs> highlights the fact that india is a responsible nuclear power point number 3 uh india has basically by stating that it has a no first use policy is also differentiating itself in general from the rest of the world not just from your pakistan china and north korea which we happen to have around us but in general from the rest of the world this is india saying you know we would have loved not to have nuclear weapons you know as a you know as and and i don't mean this in a cliched way but you know the the land of gandhi and we heard mm. so much about the land of gandhi after the nuclear oh, test yes. in 98 you know how can the land of gandhi have nuclear weapons but i think culturally uh, and systemically speaking uh, india also believes as uh, you know not just the land of gandhi because that is cliched but as a as a as a country that is genuinely a peaceful country with no territorial or extra territorial ambitions of any kind beyond protecting what is its own uh it is forced to get these weapons uh, in order to preserve its territory and preserve its sovereignty so so uh, you know manohar parikar may have uh, you know flippantly questioned the no first use policy i have in my, in my mind also wondered why but the more you think about it the more you consider it uh, it is one of the most elegant mm. policies 
uh, that India's strategic culture has ever embraced. And I don't believe it will or should actually ever change. Because uh, also remember, which is the second part of what you said, uh, you know, A, who's going to drag anyone to court if something like this happens, if, our, if we violate our own policy? B, uh, you know, if nuclear weapons are flying between two or more countries, who's going to care about the International Court of Justice? Uh, C, uh, is there going to be anything to live for if nuclear exchanges actually happen between two countries like India and China or India and Pakistan or whoever? Uh, you know, so it's uh, it, it comes back to that nuclear paradox uh, that many of the things we are thinking about now, considering about now, worrying about now, will cease to matter if nuclear weapons are flying. Yeah. Because we'll all be dead. Yeah. That's a, quite, a, quite the note. On Cheerful which, note. Yeah. On which uh, we, we end this episode. Before we go, a quick trivia. You know, as I was uh, researching, so we have the nuclear triad, we have the Agni, we have the Prithvi. Why don't we have the Jal, Vayu and Akash? Like, you know, just finish it. No, I think you should speak to someone in the... The in names, the, you mean? Yeah, the names. Because, yeah. See, because the names have already been taken. That's the reason. Oh. So, uh, 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 not the Vayu, actually. The yes, Akash, is, Akash is a surface-to-air yeah, missile. Yes. Uh, yeah, but I think I could I could Recommend. talk to them about the others. <laughs> like, for example, the K-15 missile is called Sagarika. Huh. It's an unofficial name. They Achha. still go with K-15, but for a long time, it had the working title of Sagarika. Uh, the K-4, the uh, K stands for Kalam, by the way. Okay. Uh, I have no idea what it's called, but hopefully they'll come up with some... Hmm. Some cool name. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, thanks, Shiv. Uh, great topic uh, of discussion. Uh, great insights, uh, as, as as always. Uh, thanks uh, a lot uh, for, the, for this discussion. And thanks to our viewers and, and listeners. Once again, uh, you know, leave us comments like you did with the previous episode, because of which we actually got something to talk about on this episode. Yeah. So we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to, you know, know what you think about our discussions. And if, if you have anything that you want us to discuss, do drop us a message. You can WhatsApp us at 8588966. Uh, double nine six, or you can leave a comment for us on YouTube if you, that's where you're watching us. If you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, do leave us a rating. Thanks as always to our, our lovely produ producer Anna Priyadarshini. That's it for this week's Defense Dose. For more, tune in next week. Till then, stay safe and do not cross any boundaries with us. Bye bye.